in that, in that category. And if you do fall asleep, it's a gift. They don't agree with that at the Zendo, though. Uh, uh, that, that there is an active awareness and paying attention while you are passively sitting. And the purpose of meditation, of course, is many purposes, but one is to still the body so that you might still the mind. And we, when, when, our, bo- when our minds are going, we fidget oftentimes. And, and the question is, if you can stop your body from fidgeting, it also works the other way, that you can stop your mind from fidgeting. And we are talking about developing a, sor- a form of sight, of awareness, of seeing the salvation of Godness uh, that goes from outward. So you can all see me, uh, and I can see you because you're directing your energies toward me, and I'm directing my energies toward you. And through our the, the most amazing miracle of vision, is it not incredible, that we're able to perceive each other in mental pictures. And in meditation, we begin to take the outward vision and turn that into the inward vision. Mm-hmm. And, and part of that is to develop the discipline of meditation over time where the outward vision naturally goes. It's not something that you can so much decide to do, but it does it by itself in time, over time. Well, some people can actually click it on like that, but those are mostly people who have been doing this perhaps for a while. And so your outward vision of that which is outward, the the banging and crashings of life, begins to turn inward, and in inward, things begin to happen. You begin to see in in a divine landscape in a different way. Now, so make your path straight. Uh, Linda, you're a yogi here, so you're going to have to really help me, okay? Uh, uh, Make your path straight. So in the Western tradition, most of us didn't grow up with anybody coming to church and telling us about our backbones, right? Just didn't, wasn't, I missed that in CCD, uh, which I managed to talk my mother out of, believe it or not. Uh, The only thing I ever won with my mom. But anyway... uh, So, but if you grew up in another religious tradition, they would be telling you about your body. For for a religion of the incarnation, which is what we call Jesus, that's what Christmas is the celebration of. It's not Jesus' birthday, it's the the feast of the the incarnation. We as Christians are some of the most, some of the worst incarnate religious stuff going, okay? We have a terrible, we've had many times in our tradition, terrible theology of the body. And uh, many of our other worldwide religious traditions have many gifts to give us. That our body is not to be subdued and it's, you know, the place of sin and all this stuff. You can hear it in our prayers. If you went through the Book of Common Prayer, the highlighter, you could just, just go right through and talk about our, our, the way we feel about our bodies. If one went to, uh, uh, let me just say a little bit about yoga now. And again, Linda, why don't you correct me when I'm done, okay? Uh, <laughs> that uh, the purpose of yoga is to, uh, to, connect your, to connect your spirit with what they would call in the Hindu tradition uh, universal consciousness or something like I'm not quite, I'm a little on thin ice on that. How am I doing? Okay? Uh, and, and the purpose of the asanas, they, they know the postures, is to get all the way to the end so that um, uh, in the, at least in the tradition that I have practiced, you get to Shavasana, which is the dead body pose, which I have a gift for. Okay, I, uh, and, and, and lying on the floor as you are, your backbone is straight. Still with me? Okay. Now, in the Hindu understanding of the body is much different than our uh, understanding of the body. So we understand the body primarily as though it were a machine, like an engine of a car. And when things go wrong, we go to the doctor who's the mechanic. And the surgeon fixes it with the knife, uh, and the other guy gives you this, or you know what I mean, it's an engine. But in the Hindu tradition, there would be understandings of the body as three different bodies together, essentially a physical body, an electromagnetic body, and what's known as astral, but I don't know how to say that. Can you say a word about this? There's the ether, the ethereal body, the body, and then, of course, the physical body. And the yoga practice is to bring, to merge, to yoke, or to bind all of those together in the meditation or in the asana. 
So we're talking through the breath. Through the breath. And in the spine, some yogi practices, there are mystical secrets in the spine that are released through the breath and through these postures. Okay. So, say a little word about that, then you can correct me. Uh, so in Kundalini Yoga, for instance, which is very focused on the spine, uh, there is this question of the movement of energy uh, in your back, starting at the base of your spine. And when it comes, when one, in some sense, cleans the pathway, it results in hilarity and laughter. I don't know if anybody ever experienced that, uh, having been cleansed in such a way that you broke into complete hilarity. Anyone, I mean, you don't, maybe you don't want to say that. It's, <laughs> but I mean, it's like, I mean, it's like crazy hilarious. Crazy hilarious. I mean, your stomach is like, you laugh like a baby. If you ever watch a baby laugh, their stomach is freely, babies laugh with their stomach going up and down because we're all tight, okay? So those of you who have a belt on, okay, we're actually, this is bad for you, actually. We're actually cinching our life source with a belt so we can't let it hang. I mean, we in the Western world have this thing all goofed up. And I, I did hear a wonderful history of the belt yesterday on NPR. Anybody hear that? Was that fantastic? <laughs> I was like so ready to put suspenders on after that. Uh, and, and so uh, I'm touching something I really don't know a lot about, as you can tell. I'm just trying to give you a sense of it. Uh, Linda, do you want to say something about Kundalini Yoga at all? Do you have any knowledge of that in particular? Well, it, it does. It, it is a practice through breath and through to, to release that energy so right. that you know, it, come, you know, it, it releases, connects, and then comes back. Okay, so when this happens to you, you feel as though the top of your head has been removed and there is, a, there is an energetic thing that comes uh, north or something, like they might be lying on the floor, it happens, but, and it comes right down through the back of your body and it, and it freely moves up and down. In, I, I can only say, hilarity is the only word I can call it, but it is an incredible release of energy and joy and aliveness, I mean shocking aliveness, okay? I mean you just feel like, wow, you feel like you're 17 years old. And now, and, uh, you know, and that, uh, in my conclusion of having had this experience at least once uh, in fruit, uh, was now I know why 17 year old boys drive into trees. <laughs> they're intoxicated by a particular energy that they have no they haven't, they're not smart enough to put their foot on the gas pedal, I mean on the brake yet. They just feel it with such aliveness, okay? And now, if you went to a Zendo and you were going to learn how to meditate in the Zen tradition, and you were uh, kneeling on the floor like this and you perhaps had something under your bottom and a little seat or a pillow, and the, the Zen master has a stick, and the Zen master whacks you to, the de to, to get your, if you start to slump, okay? You get ding, you get, you get dinged. Very annoying, okay? It's like, well, wait a minute. You know, Jesus didn't hit people with sticks. Why do you hit me with a stick? Uh, you know, uh, and so, but it's all so you don't collapse in upon yourself, okay? Now, uh, there, is a, there is a Jesuit priest, I think his last name is Kennedy, uh, in New Jersey, who's also a Zen master, written some interesting books. So now, so we got in the Hindu tradition in the back, you know, and we have in the Zen tradition, the Buddhist tradition, Zen is just a, is a slice of the, the Buddhist pie, uh, this question of your backbone. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. So... What these traditions tell us, they have, a different, they have a different theology, and we as Christians have a different end to what we're heading toward, but we need to learn from these traditions about our bodies and how we can use our bodies in order to advance our spiritual journey. And one of the ways we can use our bodies is that when we come together for, to, to be still before the Lord, that we pay attention to this physical lump, okay, that we live in. And if you would like to rise toward a sense of divinity, so you're rising toward divinity, you would like to cleanse your 
humanness, okay, the, 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 um, the stuff of life. You can do that by sitting in such a way, whether or not you're kneeling, whether or not you're sitting, or whether you're lying on the floor, in which you become aware that you want to open your torso, you want to elongate your spine, and you want to free your lungs from this to this. Okay, and then when you get the physical, I'm trying to say the physicality matters. So you can be on the journey and slump your way through meditation for years and make slower progress in a kind of openness that you might if you paid attention to your body and got it like this. It's a little bit like those of you who are golfers perfecting a bad golf swing or perfecting a bad tennis swing. You can play tennis with somebody uh, who's got a goofy way of hitting the ball, but they are so good at it, they are still pretty good. But if they play against a better player, they're not good anymore because it takes too long to wing the racket around three times before the ball comes, right? <laughs> uh, and, and, this, and, you know, John Kennedy's not here today. But same thing with golf swings. You can see people that are like, you know, pick their foot up and they still somehow get the ball down the fairway. But when they get with real, in a real golf situation, they can't exit. The same thing is true with meditation, that you can develop ways that are, that are good for you, but they're not optimal. And so in the optimalness of it, this is what. So the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth. I'm going to talk about this in my sermon. Some of you already heard it, but that's that's the Judean desert, and it's, it's, that's cutting from uh, Iran to Jerusalem. That's what that is, and uh, those who are on the pilgrimage, Elaine was on, uh, you know, on the pilgrimage, the, you know, the, the up and downs here. What God is saying, what the story is saying, is that that will all be filled in, so it'll be a straight highway, and God will be smooth upon the highway, and what you will get is you shall see the salvation of God. So when a, when a Christian yogi reads this, so if you went to church, uh, what was like St. Thomas Church in South India, your sermon this morning might be about this question that I'm talking about here, which is if you take the story of the scripture and you make it your bodily story and you make the crooked straight, what happens is you have the opportunity by grace to begin to see what we might call seeing God, to begin to experience a broader spiritual experience of God, this, this inward eye. So in that tradition, that would be, in the yoga tradition, that would be the third eye, right? The, the spiritual eye between, and this is the eye that can see inwardly and outwardly too, but not after, you, you have to see inwardly first before you can see outwardly. So, uh, now that may make no sense to anybody here, and I may have completely butchered it, but I wanted to put it out there because it, it is both, it, you know, it is part of the mystic way when we take the treasures of other traditions, bring it into our tradition, and, and, and don't forget, this is, this is the Old Testament being quoted by our New Testament prophet, and then applied through uh, a, a Hindu Christian lens, all in order to see the face of Jesus. Okay, anybody got a thought on that? That was a real stifler. <laughs> Right. So let's talk about that for a minute. Forgetfulness of the body. In other words, so that your body doesn't keep calling you back. So 
Uh, we have a phrase when we get stuck in our mind, you need to come to your senses, right? Someone's crazy, right? you gotta come to your senses here. Well, that's an incredible thing. We, don't, we, we, don't, we think of it proverbially, but it's actually true. We're saying when someone is lost in their brain, they need to come back down. Okay, uh, okay, so this is, yeah, I can feel this. Come back down to, in this case, there are five physical senses. Now, what Linda's talking about here is our senses also, once we've gotten from our brain to our sense, sense, sense experience, our senses can also distract us. So, uh, golly day, uh, the older you get, the more your body talks to you, right? Okay? <laughs> it starts to say, my hip hurts. Your, that doesn't feel good. My shoulder, why does my neck keep clicking every time I do that? You know, you know uh, all this bizarre stuff. And then when you go to get into particular positions, you think, you, you start to settle down, you're like, ah, uh, 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 God, I should have gone to yoga more. Oh, wow. You know, I, I mean, it, and so, and then we get antsy, and uh, if you don't mind my making your, what you said, messy and proverbial, we use, we, we, we stretch and tire the body in such a way that we can then relax into the body and forget the body. So that when the body is forgotten, no, we're no longer occupied, our consciousness is no longer occupied by the body, it is free to be occupied by God. Okay? Everybody got that? And that we in the West don't pay enough attention to this. So if you go to the yogi, the yogic stuff at the Y, for instance, and you took a poll of the people there, you know, uh, doing their thing. I would say most people are doing their thing to increase flexibility, to stretch. They're more peaceful by the end. But the lion's share are not there for prayer. It's not to say there, there are some for prayer. I have no doubt about this. I'm very, very sure of this. But this stuff was all invented, so to speak, for prayer. I mean, we secularized it in some sense, particularly in the West. And what I'm suggesting to you this morning is that we are trying to move out of our head into our body and then through our body to being to consciousness before God. And so we have to forget the body. Okay, so any thoughts on that? Uh, the, the trouble is always gravity. Gravity, it's a real problem. Amen. So I, by my little technique, or one of them is, I run up at Waveney, and at the end of the run, there's the best expanse of lawn out there uh, in the yeah. world, and you just lie flat on your back with your arms out, looking up, hoping that somebody isn't thinking this old guy just <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> the back of my mind. Wendy Hillbolt shows up, right, yeah, with a... Gorgeous. So I highly recommend Waveney in the, in the lawn. <laughs> and the kids aren't playing soccer also. <laughs> okay, so let's talk about that. Okay, so the, the, Cliff, awesome. So, you know, if you grew up thinking your devotional life was supposed to look one way, I can tell you it was never better than what Cliff just did. And so uh, that if you, if you lie down outside, you get double benefit. One of which is the earth has energy in it. And you can be healed by the earth from the bottom, from the back up, okay? And you can absorb the earth's energies. And there's a great book out there called Healed by the Earth by a healer I used to go see in Cleveland. Uh, and he, he had gotten sick. He had been in Brazil, he was a psychologist. And he went to Brazil and he got a, a bug, bit him, and embedded itself in his body. And he went to the Cleveland Clinic, and they sent him home to die. He was a gardener, and he said to his wife, well, I'm going to die in my garden. And so he lay a blanket down, and he just laid in his garden. Well, 
He, they said he was going to die in three weeks, and he didn't die in three weeks. It's a funny story, actually. Like, three weeks came and went. He's like, hey, wait a minute, I'm not dead yet. Uh, and he then kept lying there, and then he actually lay there all winter, and he lay there in spring, and he lay in the garden for two years. And uh, when I met him, and I got sent to him because I had a plantar fasciitis in my feet I couldn't get rid of, and all my athletic friends said, oh, you gotta, you're, you're, don't go to any more doctors, you're never gonna solve it, go see this guy. And he did. And he glowed like the sun, uh, and he could see all of our energy patterns. So if he looked at you, he could see your, your chakra energy patterns. And uh, he would then stand and shoot. You'd stand, he had a white rug, and stand in the white rug, and you'd stand like this with your shoes off, and he'd have his shoes off, and he would shoot his energy up the bottom of your feet. And that sounds crazy. And I won't go into, I had wild, crazy religious experience with this guy. And I mean like, wow, kooky stuff. And so I mentioned this to a friend of mine whose kid played soccer with one of my kids. She was a Presbyterian minister and a hospital chaplain. And she went to see him. He walked in the door. She walked in the door and she said, he said to her, excuse me, I'm so sorry. And she said, about what? And he said, well, you were abused as a child by your father. And she said, well, how do you know? And he said, well, I can see it in your energy systems. So we have an energy system that breaks down the middle. I mean, the, not only these woofers, but breaks down the middle. And, and he said, your genital area is milky, milky white. And there's no clarity there. And your energetic uterus is sideways. And he said, and this is what happens to those who are sexually abused by their parents as children. And she was sexually abused by her father when she was a child. So what I'm trying to suggest to you is that if you do, I'm back to Cliff here, long way to get back to Cliff, that with the earth, there are gifts to be laid out by picking up energy from the earth. And also, when you lie down on the earth, I used to lie down the earth on the way to work in Cleveland. I always came to work with my backside completely dirty. I was a bizarre looking dude. Uh, and you take, you go down to your root chakra between your, between your genitals and your rear, and it's like you have a zipper, and you unzip it, okay? And you just open it all up, and then just as Cliff said, I mean, Cliff, I pray like the altar, hands out, okay, like you're on the crucifix, and open it all up and invite the divine in. Invite the divine in to, be, to let go and to be cleansed. And if you do it outside, the treasures are incredible. Like you just, I loved your, your, your treasures. Thank you. Really beautiful. Anybody with another comment about Cliff lying on the ground and having the EMT come? <laughs> I've had dogs comments. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so a word about that. Uh, Martha, one sec. So a word about that. So if you meditate, okay, you, vi you change the vibratory, the, vi the way your body vibrates. We are all vibrating. And if you meditate, you change your vibra vibratory pattern. And one of the things that you do is you vibrate at the same pattern that many animals vibrate on. And so when you see St. Francis out there in the backyard with, the, with, the, with all the um, uh, birds smushing around, in the wa shushing around in the water, it's because during Francis's meditation time, Francis lived outside, okay? He did not live in, he lived, Francis basically lived outside. He lived in caves for the most part. He would meditate outside, and the animals would come sit with him. And uh, if you've ever read the stories uh, of St. Francis done by uh, Francis' right-hand guy, and I might get to say his name wrong, Thomas Chilano, I don't know if I've said that quite right. He tells these great stories of Francis yelling at the, the lone wolf to quit terrorizing the people, and you know, Francis solving animal problems. Well, I mean, those dogs might need to come to sniff Cliff or go to the bathroom, I'm not sure. But anyway, I can tell you that if you meditate, your cat or your dog is likely to come visit with you because you're beginning to vibrate at a different level. Martha? Um, well, it reminds me of Disney's Snow White. I think she was one of those people. Oh. <laughs> um, and when I used to do Reiki, um, the cat would come and, the Reiki master's cat would come and sit on the table. But anyway, um, I was also going to talk about um, negative ions from salt water and 
rushing waters, my, mountain streams, and mountains that are also not just the earth, but um, a special kind of healing from those aspects in nature too. You know, when people go to the, the sea to be healed, or right. mineral springs, or the mountains does something to them. And so true. Do we, do we, we know that intuitively. Thank you for saying that. We know that intuitively. I know somebody who is a hospital chaplain and absorbs a lot of bad gunk and she takes a month-long vacation, and every day she sits uh, on a rock in, in the ocean. Okay, so what Martha just described is the reason we have a fountain. Okay, we have a fountain. We have a fountain because nobody was using our incredible courtyard. This is a really, really beautiful space. It's designed on the cloister. It's a modernized version of a monastic cloister, cleaned up. I mean, there's no... You don't, there's no Gothic swirls anywhere. It's, it's, it's cleaned up. But if you look at it, it's the same shape as a monastic cloister. And in a monastic cloister, the, pur the purpose of a monastic cloister is to walk around it with your, with your prayer beads and, and to be in the place outside, in the place of peace, saying your prayers. There's something about being outside that matters. And, and so... To, if you look at monasteries across the world, so many of them are built next to rushing water because of this, this cleansing effect of the water. And so one of the things we did is we put the fountain here to bring people into our cloister for prayer because there's something about this running water. I never could have named it as negative ions, but when we put this here, suddenly people started to use the courtyard. And it was based on that same same purpose. Good work. Speaking of uh, push, uh, many years ago, I did a talk that push, pushed us to do yoga. And the first thing I learned was so interesting. It says when you walk, walk as if you're trying to have your head hit the ceiling. You just try to sort of stretch yourself so that as if you're trying to hit, you know, touch the ceiling. Mm -hmm. I thought that was very really useful to get the posture that you know, right. improved. Yeah. Thank you. I'm wondering if part of the um, draw of the fountain is the sound of the water. Because I know my favorite time at the beach is after everybody leaves, just sitting alone with the great sky and the great beyond and the, the water, the sound of the ocean. So true. So true. Well, um, my family has a place up in the Catskills. And it's at the end of the road. Then it's this mountain. You know, if you Google Earth it, it's just like, whoa, <laughs> green mountains. And we're at the end of the road, the last house. And so it gets so quiet up there. And you can hear the wind blowing. Mm. It's just the most beautiful thing in the world. And I love it up there. And I mean, having streams as well. And um, I do a little yoga routine outside in the morning. And it's all standing, you know, or sitting. It's, it's this little morning cup of yoga thing I found. <laughs> I found it at some library Great. book sale for Great. <laughs> and I, I just do it. And it is, um, you know, nothing. But I, I, I try to bring it home with me because our house is a summer house and we can't use it in the winter. And I miss those feelings I get up there right. where I'm in the middle of nowhere so much. And so in the mornings when I bring my dogs outside, I, I do a little bit of it. And I just find that it helps me so much to just open myself up. You know, I don't do the whole routine at home, which I should, but, um, you know, and now I'm thinking, what am I going to do now that it's getting colder and colder? And uh, I do go out with my parka on, but um, I uh, just really um, feel like it is, it is, it's so important to open yourself up and get those deep breaths in. And when I go to a yoga class at the Y, I always feel like there is something missing. Because it isn't prayerful, you know? Mm. So, Interesting. Yeah. That yeah, thank you. That's really beautiful. Really beautiful. Um, Robin talking about the sound of the water reminded me also of how frequencies of sound heal us. 
mm -hmm. and you know the the singing role and chanting and um, I think Linda's going to do something on that um, as part of the mystic way every day um, the healing power of chanting and frequency um, that resonates with the vibrations in our body and heals us mm -hmm. and I think that's why we love music on Sunday morning too there's something about for sure all the frequencies for sure for sure uh, you, Martha, I don't think people like your comments because they're all getting up to leave. Uh, no, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, no, I, I'm just, what time is it? So I'm kidding. What time? No, no, no. What time is it? 9.40. Oh, 9.40. Oh, we'll take another minute or two, and then this is getting ready for church. Uh, thank you for that. No, there's no question that I think what, what are the things. So, so in the, in the, uh, back to this whole question about what is our body. You know, yesterday we talked about, uh, not, I don't know, I can't remember what, what you said was exactly, but at Tatum's funeral, the, the question of the soul and the spirit and, and the, um, you know, the physicality that we have. I mean, we're all aware that our physicality goes back to you know, Einstein's formula that uh, equals mc squared, that we are, we're simply hardened energy, right? And, and, and just like a particle uh, you know, can be can be hard, or, or like water can be hard, like ice, or it can be drinkable, it can be liquid, or it can be um, up in the air. So it is that, the, that we as energy particles are formed and then, we, then, then it dies, right? But, but, we, but we live in those energy particles and they vibrate. All this stuff vibrates. So if, you have a, if you're a nuclear scientist, uh, we all know that, I mean, it's really bizarre if you think about this from a physics perspective, that like the smallest little part of us isn't solid at all. So like what is it that's solid? How does it get to be solid if every particle is actually moving and it's in an electromagnetic field of smaller particles that are held together in this electromagnetic field that then attach to another bunch of particles. And so that the, the kind of physics of physicality is completely weird if you really think about it and if you understand it. Uh, but it is, reminds us that we are vibrating and that our vibratory patterns affect the way we are. And so if you went to the whirling dervishes, and back to Linda, our only whirling dervish. Uh, uh, it was only one. Uh, I wish, I would love to whirl dervish. I gotta try that. I gotta, uh, I would like to whirl and dervish. Uh, is that this, in another tradition, is done to reach a mystical state. That's what we're getting at here, a state of consciousness. But it's dealing with your physicality. That's, what our, that's the purpose of today. Um, there are passages in the Bible where uh, Jesus goes off by himself to pray. Right. Um, do you have any insight uh, <laughs> as to whether his prayers were meditative in nature? Um, is, is there, I mean, you obviously know more about this than well, not necessarily. Uh, I just talk more. Uh, uh, I'll give you one sec, Marianne. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, okay, so in the Bible, Jesus goes to pray all the time. And once you start to see it, it's all over the place. And, and so you can see that. So in the beginning of Mark's gospel, right? I mean, Mark's gospel goes bang, 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 bang. It's right. It's like reading, it's like reading, uh, um, uh, monarch notes, whatever we used to call the cheat notes. Uh, yeah, cliff notes. So, but right when, after his first day of ministry, everything on Bay happens in one day, the next morning, he goes off in pre-dawn to pray alone. In Luke's gospel, he goes all the time. Anytime, he's always running off to pray. He's trying to get rid of these people to go pray. What he does in his prayer, we have very little knowledge of. It's very little knowledge. We would love to know what he did. But one said, in John's gospel, you get some insight into, greater insight into the content of Jesus' prayer life, where it says much more about what he prayed. Yeah. Marianne? Oh, okay. Uh, yesterday at the service, the general service, you talked a lot about Emmanuel's vision work, and I think you said he was a mystic, and I wondered if you were going to talk about it in this mystic way. I, I did not say that he was a mystic, um, though he... Well, he had 25 years of, of uh, 
I'll just say it and then we can all go. Uh, Emanuel Swedenborg was a genius, uh, the, uh, perhaps the smartest man of the 1800s in, in, in the West and agreed on by geniuses. Uh, the, the, uh, the IQ test, when they started to line up about it, when intelligence became a thing, they all looked to him and they designed the IQ test after him. He was a, a devout Protestant Christian. He read the Bible for an hour a day every morning. He uh, was a businessman, and he, again, he was a genius. He was a savant. He read everything that was available to read in the West, from, from biology and chemistry and physics, poetry, literature, everything. He did not have available to him what we would now, I mean, we have everything in the world available to us now, almost. You know, all Eastern literature, he did not have available to him. He developed in his own life a way of praying, uh, what we would now call meditation. Nobody taught meditation in those days. He didn't know what it was. And he, in his prayer life, came to a place where he realized he simply needed to be silent. One day in his silence, he received a locution, which is an inner voice. And the locution said to him, for the next 25 years, for the rest of you, your life, I will bring you daily to heaven and hell. And so for the next 25 years, he had uh, daily visitation experiences of heaven and hell. He wrote these experiences down in a series of diaries, which are, I believe, at the Swedenborg Library on the back end of Harvard, near the Episcopal, right near the Episcopal Divinity School, Brattle Street. Uh, I think that's what it's called. Uh, uh, those of you who know Cambridge. And he also wrote several books in which he wrote in particular. I mean, the one that I read is, a, it, is called Heaven and Hell. Uh, he, he was a very devout man. And one of the things he said is, it's all true. The Bible is all true. It's all true. And, but we don't actually know in many cases what it means because we interpret it, the, the, we interpret the mystical sayings, we interpret the sayings through earthly eyes in which we don't grasp the heavenly implications. And so some of the things, you've got Justin the theologian here, one of the, one of the things he talks about is that in, the, in his experience of the heavens, I mean, this is a whole conversation about the things he experiences about the human condition, about what it's like there, what happens after you die, what sin is, you know, what grace is. I mean, it, it's amazing. He goes through all of this stuff that we talk about. And, but one of the things that if you read it, certainly animates your own spiritual life to realize certain things that Jesus said were dead on and that that's what the whole thing is based on. And now just the last final summary of those of you who went to Tatum's funeral, you might have figured it out that what is the number one thing to do? When someone says, how, how can I get close to God? And it's, it's always the summary of the law, right? To love the Lord, to God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, and your neighbor as yourself. That is like, that's the whole Bible. The Bible in summary is right there. It's not, and they said, you know, it's not John 3, 16. Luther said that was the New Testament in summary, but the Bible in summary is the summary of the law. And so, for instance, when you read Swedenborg, you see that applied to the heavens, okay? Because all, uh, you know, we're all created in love and for love. And, uh, and we should really, in Lent, talk about this because he talks about sin. What is, and, and sin is an amazing thing that mangles us, mangles us. And we can't see it. We don't energetically see it. But he said in the heavens, you can see how it distorts and mangles people. There's two loves in the heavens, as I said yesterday, love of God and love of neighbor. But there's one love in hell. You know what that is? Yeah, love of the self. And that, and that people who love themselves all gather together in hell, uh, and uh, they all think they look great. And uh, this is a really fantastic. And... They, but if you are in the heavens and you look down upon them, they look grotesque in the manglings of their bodies because, and what have they done? You know what their sin is? Their sin is hoarding love. That's the sin. Sin is given freely to be given away. It's all about flow or to be lost in the flow. Make your paths straight, right? It's all let every valley shall be, you shall see. It's all about the flow. And in hell, we mangle the flow, and it mangles our lives, mangles our worlds, and it has eternal ramifications. Boom, we got to go.